Hi, and welcome back to program analysis. So we are in the lecture on call graph analysis, and this is part three of this lecture in which we'll look into another um, set of two algorithms to construct call graphs in a static analysis, namely VTA and DTA. Um, you'll see in a second what this actually means. Um, the key idea of these two algorithms is that in contrast to what we've seen in the previous lecture, they do reason about assignments in the program and by doing this can rule out some calls that um, according to the analyses that we've seen in the previous video may happen but actually may not happen if you reason about assignments. The first of the two algorithms that um, we want to look at here is called VTA or variable type analysis. So as I said the main idea um, of this and also the next algorithm is to reason about assignments and here, in case of VTA, the idea is that it does that in order to infer what types the objects involved in the call may actually have. So, for example, if you know the type of a base object of a call, then you can rule out some other um, um, call targets that are not possible because it's simply not one of the types that you know the base object to have. And by knowing this type of information, what the variable type analysis algorithm can do is to prune calls and um, um, also nodes from the call graph um, that are infeasible at uh, runtime. So before explaining exactly how the algorithm works, let's have a look at a simple example. So in this example, um, there is um, some class X that is instantiated. Then the um, variable that stores this instance of X is assigned to a different variable. And this is then passed as an argument into a call to F. And um, not knowing anything else, um, we look at these two classes here, A and B, that implement this method F. Um, so we um, know that um, the call will end up in one of these two um, methods. And now looking at the assignments, which is what this algorithm is basically about, we see that this newly created object is assigned to A. And then we see that A is assigned to B. And because of this call, we also see that this B is assigned to this um, parameter C here, and it may also be assigned to the other parameter C here in this other implementation of the method F. So in a nutshell, what the algorithm will do for this example is to create a graph where every variable in the program is represented by a node. So we will have one node for this variable A, another node for the variable B, and then another node for the parameter C of F in class A. So we will just write this as A.F.C. And then another one for the other implementation of F, where we also have, have a parameter called C, and that's B.F.C. And then what the algorithm is doing is to look at the types that are um, propagated through assignments. So we know that um, initially we have this type X here because we know that this variable will have this type. And then looking at the assignments, um, these types are propagated so that for this simple example at the very end, what we'll have is a graph where we know that B may also have type X, A dot F dot C may also have type X, and B dot F dot C may also have type X. So this is the idea in a nutshell, and now we'll see how this works in general, and also we'll look at um, slightly more complex examples. So in general, this algorithm consists of four steps, um, which are needed to propagate the types through the program. The first one is that we need some initial conservative call graph. Um, because we um, want to propagate uh, the information from the call side to potential parameters where the arguments may go to, we somehow need to know where um, calls may end up. So we already need a call graph to start with. And this call graph needs to be conservative in the sense that it is guaranteed to contain all the edges that may happen at runtime, because otherwise the result of this um, VTA algorithm will also um, 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 not be conservative. Um, for example, we could use the two algorithms that we've seen in the last video, um, class hierarchy analysis or rapid type analysis, in order to construct this initial call graph. Once we have this initial call graph, we can build the initial type propagation graph, which is um, the first step that I've shown you um, for the simple example on the previous slide. 
And then as an optimization, what the algorithm will do is to collapse strongly connected components. So this is just an optimization. It doesn't really need to um, be done, but um, it helps to make the remaining propagation a little faster. And then once this is done, the final step is to propagate the types in a single um, iteration um, through this graph. And we'll see how this works um, in a second. So to build this initial type propagation graph, what the algorithm is doing is to look at all the assignments that may happen in the program. So for example, if you have a statement um, A equal B, so an assignment of B to A, which happens to be in a method C.M, then what we'll get is um, um, two nodes that represent these two variables, CMA and CMB, and an edge in between that um, corresponds to this um, data flow that the assignment in uses. Um, as another example, if we have a statement like this, where um, uh, B is assigned to the field F of some um, variable A, and let's assume that F is actually a field of a class capital A, then what we'll get is a representation of this field uh, as capital A dot F. So this represents all the fields F of all instances of this class A. And we'll say that um, the um, variable B, which let's assume is again in C dot M, gets assigned to this field by having this edge here in the graph. So as an example, let's assume we have this piece of code here where we have three classes A, B and C, which are in a subtype relationship so that B is a subtype of uh, A and C is a subtype of B. And then we have a couple of variables, A1, A2 and so on of these types. We instantiate all of them um, into um, different objects that we assign to the variables A1, A2 and so on. And then down here, um, we have a list of assignments where we are basically assigning some objects to some of the other variables. Um, and note in particular that here we are assigning um, A3 to an instance um, of, uh, sorry, to a variable declared to be of type B and therefore we need to cast it in order to make this whole code type correct. Let's now look at how the graph, the type propagation graph for this example would look like. So we um, will have one node for every um, variable in this piece of code. So one for A1, another one for A2, yet another one for A3. The same for all the uh, B variables, B1, B2, and B3. And then finally one for C. And now what the uh, algorithm does is to look at all the assignments in the program where one of these variables is assigned to another one. And for example, because we have this one assignment here where A2 is assigned to A1, meaning that A2 is flowing um, to A1, we will have the corresponding edge in our graph. Um, similarly, for example, for the second assignment here, the one where um, a1 is assigned to A3, we will have um, a corresponding edge um, going from A1 to A3. And this is then done for all the assignments that we have here. So we also see one for A3 um, getting the value of, of B3. Um, then we have the inverse um, with this assignment where we have the cast. We also see that um, B2 is assigned to B1. And then eventually C is also assigned to B1. Having this graph, the algorithm is now looking at um, the um, call sites of, the, of constructors in order to find out what types these variables may have. And initially it uh, just assigns the uh, uh, yeah, instantiated type of every constructor call to the corresponding variable. So based on these um, constructor calls that we have up here, what we'll do in this example is that um, we say that A2 has type A and the same for A1. So these are always sets of types, but, but initially there's exactly one um, type in each set, namely the one that gets instantiated. And then the same here for B2 and B1, where we know that um, their type can only be B at this point. And the same here for um, variable C, which must have type C, or at least initially will have this type. Next, the algorithm is going to collapse strongly connected components. So in this 
Um, example, we have exactly one such strongly connected component. So it's basically a subgraph where every node is connected to every other node through an edge. Um, and this is this subgraph here, which means that um, we can actually consider this um, these two nodes, this strongly connected component as just a single node. And we do not have to um, propagate um, types um, be, well, in this um, strongly connected components because anyway, we know that whatever type one of them has, all of them will have it. And now the final step of the algorithm is to propagate the types along the edges of our graph. So we will start by propagating um, along this edge, which means that we take the type that is at the source of this edge, which in this case is this type A, and add it to the types that are at the target of this edge, which already contains A, which means for this particular edge, we do not have to do anything. Um, things are more interesting for this edge up here because that means we will propagate this type A um, here to the um, to this node that is this large node represented by the strongly connected component. Um, and this basically means we now know that each of these two variables A3 and B3 can have also type A. And then let's do the same down here for the remaining two edges. So looking at this edge, um, we can now add type C to this um, type that B1 may have. So it's not only B anymore, but it can be B or C. And um, propagating this edge doesn't change anything because we already know that um, B1 may have type uh, B. And now knowing the types that these variables may potentially have will help the algorithm to construct a more uh, precise call graph. In this small example, we do not actually have any interesting calls where this could help. But um, just to complete this example, let's assume that we do have um, an additional call down here, which is calling, let's say, um, the method M of, uh, let's say, B1. So let's say we have something like um, B1.M here. And let's assume that this um, method M is implemented by A, B, and C, then a very naive approach would be to say, well, we could call um, A.M or B.M or C.M here. But in um, with this algorithm here, we know that um, B1 can only have type B or C, which means that it will never call A.M, but only um, B.M or C.M. As a little side note, one interesting question in this kind of algorithm is how to actually represent fields. So if you have a field of an object and you want to reason about the types that this field may have, then there are different ways to represent this field. Um, so one option um, is to um, represent the field as the field of this specific object. So if you have an object stored in variable A and, and the field F of that um, field is accessed, then you would just represent this as A.F. This is called field sensitive, and this is the most precise way of doing this, but also the most expensive way, because then you have to reason about all the different variables and their fields separately. Another option is what is called field insensitive. In this case, you would represent um, all fields of a variable A as the same field. So you would basically collapse all the fields that a class may have into just one artificial field, which um, is more manageable in the analysis, but of course less precise, and this is called um, field insensitive. And then the fourth approach um, is kind of um, in between these two, um, and this is called field based. So here the idea is that you're not collapsing all the fields of a class, but you're collapsing all the instances of a class with respect to a particular field. And you would represent um, a field um, uh, A.F as um, capital A.F, where A is the class of your variable A, um, so that Basically, all the instances of that class um, have um, um, or are thought to have the same field F, even though, of course, in practice, this is not the case, but um, it makes the analysis uh, more scalable because it doesn't have to distinguish between the different fields F of all the different instances of your class A. Now you may wonder what of these, uh, which of these approaches does the um, uh, variable type analysis algorithm actually use? The answer is that um, VTA is field-based, so it will collapse all the different instances of a class A with respect to a particular field F, so that um, it doesn't have to distinguish between all the different 
variables and the fields that they have, but can scale more easily to larger programs. So let's summarize this algorithm, variable type analysis or VTA. So it has a couple of advantages. In particular, it's more precise than the two previous algorithms that we have seen. In particular, it's also more precise than rapid type analysis, RTA, because it does only consider those types of a variable or field that may actually reach the particular call site because it reasons about assignments instead of just looking at all the types that are used somewhere in the program. At the same time, it's still relatively fast because it um, only propagates information once through this graph, um, which is still um, relatively fast and allows the algorithm to scale to relatively large programs. On the downside, um, the VTA algorithm requires some initial call graph because it's actually a refinement algorithm that starts from a call graph, which is um, required in order to know what um, uh, concrete arguments are propagated to um, particular parameters, and then it can refine this initially given call graph. The other um, downside is that um, it still has some imprecision, for example, because it's a field-based analysis, which if, as we've seen on the previous slide, is going to um, yeah, um, um, merge fields that are actually not the same at runtime to simplify the overhead of the analysis. The second algorithm that uh, we want to briefly discuss in this lecture is um, called declared type analysis. And this can be seen as a variant or maybe the small brother of the variable type analysis that we've um, just seen. It also reasons about assignments that happen in the program, but it doesn't do this based on all the different variables and fields that we have in the program, but based on um, the types that um, are uh, assigned to each other. So it's not per variable, but actually um, per type, which makes the whole algorithm more scalable, but also less precise. So let's have a look what this declared types analysis is doing for the example that we've just seen before. Um, so in that um, case, we will again have a graph, but now the nodes in our graph are not the variables and fields that we have in the program, but they are the types that are um, present in this program. So in this example, we will have one node for type A, another node for type B, and then yet another node for type C. And now looking at the assignments in the program, we will add edges to this graph. So for example, because we have this um, assignment um, here, where we are assigning um, something of declared uh, type B to something of declared type A, um, we will have an edge that goes from B to A. Um, implicitly, there are also, of course, edges um, between A's, but these are not represented in this graph because anyway, all instances of A, uh, or sorry, all variables of A are represented by a single node. Um, then just one line below, we also have an assignment from an A to a B. So we also have um, the reverse edge. And then because in the last line of the program, we have an assignment from something declared to be C to something declared to be B. We also have this edge in our um, graph. Apart from the fact that this graph is not about variables, but about types, the rest of the algorithm is essentially the same. So we will now add the initial types to each of the nodes. We'll then um, merge strongly connected components in the graph and then propagate types in order to get a final solution. So adding the initial types is um, pretty trivial because um, since each node represents a type, um, the initial type is obviously exactly that type itself. So for A, it's A and so on. Um, then the algorithm looks for strongly connected components, which here means that it will find this one um, because um, these two nodes are connected to each other. So it's a strongly connected component. And as a result, we can now actually um, also um, or because we merge them anyway, um, we also have to merge their types, which means that we know that um, all these instances of um, variables declared to be A or B may have either the type A or the type B. And then the um, final step is to propagate the types according to the graph that we have right now. And in this case, this means um, there's just one edge, namely this one, along which we need to propagate. And what this means here is that we will propagate the type C into the set of types that this um, new big node may have. 
um, which then tells us that um, every variable that is either declared to be a or b may have objects of type a, b, and c. Now let's compare what we get um, from this declared type analysis um, with what we have um, seen in the variable type analysis that we've just seen before. Um, so if we just go back to what we found there, we see that for um, variable C, um, we'll essentially find the same because according to VTA, C may have type C. And this is also what we find um, from DTA because here we see that um, uh, C, because it has declared type C, may only have type C. So for that variable, everything stays the same. But um, the second algorithm that we've seen is actually less precise for some of the other variables. For example, for variable B2, um, the VTA algorithm has told us that it may only have um, type B, right? So this is what we found here. But now if we look at what we know about um, B2 according to the DTA algorithm, um, then we see that because B2 has statically declared type B, it's one of the um, variables that is represented by this big node here. And as we can see, it has, um, according to this DTA analysis, three possible types, A, B, C, um, which is of course less precise than just saying that it has um, only type B. So DTA um, is simpler and the graph is smaller and therefore everything will be a little faster, but at the same time, it's of course less precise. So just to summarize the pros and cons of this algorithm, um, it's definitely faster than VTA because the graph is much smaller and as a result, the whole propagation is, um, is faster, which allows this algorithm to scale um, to larger programs. And at the same time, it's more precise than the rapid type um, analysis algorithm that we've seen in the previous video. On the downside, um, DTA is less precise than its bigger brother um, variable type analysis, simply because it does not distinguish the different variables that have the same statically declared type and therefore merges all the information. And because it always merges this information in a conservative way so that it doesn't miss any type that a variable may have, um, it's as a result less precise than um, VTA. All right, and that's all that I have in uh, video number three of this lecture on call graph analysis. So you have now seen um, already four different algorithms, two of which do not reason about assignments and two of which uh, seen in this lecture that do reason about assignments. And what we'll do in the next and final lecture is, a, um, is to have a look at an even more sophisticated algorithm for computing call graphs that also looks at um, the um, objects that a variable may point to. Thank you very much for listening and see you next time.